But yeah, my name is Benny Chow. I'm a principal software engineer here at Dremio. And uh, today I'm really excited to talk to you about materialized views on Iceberg. Um, this is one area where Dremio has invested a lot of R&D um, in terms of query acceleration and just making SQL queries fast. All right. Okay, so if you don't know, um, in the context, context of today's discussion, uh, Dremio is a lakehouse query engine. Right, so you know, Dremio can run federated queries against many different types of sources. Um, it can ingest batch and streaming data into Apache Iceberg tables, and then also it can accelerate queries using a technology uh, called Reflections. And underneath the cover of Reflections is based on uh, materialized views, which is our talk today. So the agenda for today is um, we're going to start by talking a bit about what is the difference between Dremio Reflections versus materialized views. Um, they're both you know, used for query acceleration, but Dremio Reflections is like, you know, I, would, I was almost described as like, you know, materialized views on steroids. Uh, then we'll get into the discussion of uh, the, our implementation journey, right? Moving from uh, parquet files to iceberg tables. And really this comes down to a lot of performance benefits that we got um, by moving over. Then we'll talk about some of the new uh, features uh, that were enabled because of Iceberg. And I think really the most interesting thing here is, is how we were able to be much more efficient with our incremental refreshes because of uh, the snapshot history. And then finally, we'll touch on um, some interesting uh, um, um, things that are happening in the community around uh, the Iceberg materialized view specification and, and you know, what, what role Dremio could play here. All right, so let's start with the basics. Um, so what is a materialized view, right? I mean, it's, it's basically a view that has been materialized into a storage table. It's, it's basically a cache, right? And the idea here is that you want to pre-compute expensive operations like scans, filters, projects, points, and aggregates. Do it one time and basically take it out of, out of the query time, right? And, and, and by doing so, you, you make your SQL queries very fast, right? Um, and so each materialization, when, when you create one, right, it needs to track um, basically the state of the query tree at the time of the materialization, right? And so, I mean, you need, to, you need this information really for two things. One is for you to be able to validate, you know, when you're about to use the materialization, you know, the, the, the staleness or the, or the validity <clears throat> of that materialization. And, and two, you also need, need this query tree to help you uh, with refreshing your, uh, your materialization. So, for example, whether you need whether data has changed at all, right? And if so, whether you can do the refresh incrementally. So, um, you know, if you go into the details of what we need to track here, right, it, it starts to depend on what the source data is that's going into the materialization. So, if like your source uh, table, uh, your source data <clears throat> is iceberg, then you know you probably want to track like the the table snapshot IDs, right? Um, if your source data might be like relational databases, you may be tracking like the max, uh, you know, um, uh, key of some table. In addition, you know, uh, views can depend on other views, like views can de depend on hundreds of views, right? So you want to also track, um, if in case of Iceberg, maybe the view IDs. But if it's not Iceberg, you might track um, the view sequels or a hash of the view sequels. Now, one thing that's really important with uh, uh, you know, materialized views in their storage is that you have an opportunity to basically optimize the da the data file layout, right? And and so like you know you want to be able you want to be able to partition and cluster the data so that you can really maximize your data file pruning uh, at query access time. And so that's a, that's a key component of like you know when you want to build your materializations. All right, so let's talk a bit about Dremio reflections. So. Um, as I said, you know, uh, uh, Dremio uses a reflections to accelerate queries, and, and underneath the covers, it's essentially materialized views. Now, th there is actually a lot of differences here, right? So, generally, uh, uh, a materialized view is one to one with the view. So, whatever like view schema, SQL, or data that you're exposing from the view is what you're going to materialize, right, into that materialization storage table of that view, right? Whereas a reflection you know, you can, you can think of it as, as basically many to one with the view, right? So like if, if a view had 10,000 columns, right? The, the reflection may just materialize a subset of those views columns. 
or if you um, wanted to aggregate on certain columns of the view and, and compute measures, right, then that would be considered an aggregate reflection. So in Dremel's uh, uh, land, you know, terminology, a, a materialized view is not necessarily a database object. Um, but of course, if you have a view where you materialize every single column, right, then then yes, then that that would be a that's what we call a default raw reflection. And the reason why we do this is is has to do with reflection matching, which is the process of like where you, um, you know, where the planner needs to figure out how to take a, a, a reflection and then put it into a user's query tree, right? So you, you can kind of imagine that like when a user runs a SQL statement, right? It gets converted into a query tree. And so what reflection matching is doing is basically matching uh, subtrees of that user query against the original query tree of that reflection. Right. And, and when things don't exactly match, then there's a process called unification where you might, you know, add filters or aggregates on top of the materialization um, 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 table to make it look like the user query. All right. So let's let's just jump into the Dremel UI and let me show you a quick demo of how, the, how all this stuff looks. Right. Um, All right, so here's a Dremel UI. Um, I have an example here of a view that's based on TPCDS uh, number three, query three. And so, you know, this is a, this is a very simple uh, query with three joins. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, create a, uh, a reflection on this um, on that view, All right? And so this this runs a job, and behind the scenes, it's going to generate um, a materialization, right? And here, the the, the materialization store is iceberg table. And then if I go back to the original query, I can go ahead and run. Um, I'll go ahead and run it. And then we, we, we can check the query profile. And then we'll see that this query was just accelerated right, by that materialization that we just created. And the thing I'll point out is that like, you know, I didn't run a select star on that view directly. I actually ran the original SQL of that view. And our planner was able to match that query tree against the query tree of the reflection and basically replace that into the into the into into the query query plan, and we can see these type of details in the raw profile. So, for example, if I go to the planning tab, you'll see that this was the kind of the original query tree where we had those three joins, filter, project, ag, right. Whereas, if you go look down into logical planning, where we do cost based optimization, you know, to make the to, to make choices between whether it's better to use a reflection versus scanning the base table. In this, in this case, we replaced those three joins with that materialization uh, scan, right? Um, here, this is the logical plan. So if you go down into the physical plan, that's where you'll see like now the iceberg, you know, iceberg metadata, you know, activity. So, so here is the manifest list scan. Here's a scan against uh, the manifest files. And then finally, here's where we, uh, we're querying the data files, right? So if you're familiar with, uh, you know, iceberg metadata, this this is you know the typical flow. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. All right, so let's talk about the implementation journey. Um, so before, I mean, uh, Dremio has had this query acceleration technology for a long time, right? Um, but in the beginning, in the early days, it, you know, the, the materialization storage was basically a bunch of parquet files um, in the file system, right? Um, now, as for the metadata over these parquet files, it was basically in a proprietary format that we stored in uh, a key value store, in this case, RocksDB, right? And so that metadata, metadata that we had to capture was like the schema, the partition spec, uh, but also, you know, for every single data file that was present um, in that materialization, we'd also had to track like which partition it belonged to. So if you had, say, for example, a thousand partitions and, and 20,000 files per partition, you're looking at 20 million uh, records, right, in, in, in this KV store, right? Uh, the other thing that we had to also track was the partition stats, right? And, and these, you know, it would tell you for each partition how many rows are in there, and you need that information to do like join planning, join implementation, and you know, parallelism of the scans, right? So one of the challenges that we had with with uh, you know this original design was that you know uh, we would end up bloating our metadata store, right? And so we had to put like limits, right, in place, 
Um, so in this case, it was 20 million falls per table, right? Now let's talk about what happened when we moved to Iceberg, right? So uh, when the storage table is in Iceberg format, right, the data files in our case is still parquet, so that hasn't really changed, right? But now the metadata is in an open format that's stored in a you know distributed file system, right? And so those metadata files, you know, are the usual characters right here: metadata, JSON, manifest list, manifest files. But really, the key, uh, you know, one of the key features here is that like now there's no limit to the you know unlimited data files, right? It's it's there's basically unlimited splits, right? And so what that means is that now there's no limit to the table sizes, right? But of course, you know there is also um, some challenges that we ran into, which is where do we where do we store the partition stats, right? Because we you know we still need that for planning, and so as a result, we had to do an engine specific workaround to write like Avril stat falls um, in the met metadata metadata directory that only the Dremel engine is 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 aware of and it would use for planning. All right. Okay, so let's talk a bit about query planning, right? So um before you know so this 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 what this is one area where the where query plans where this has really changed significantly right so when when planning a query um against the materialization table right um you know once the planner has decided you know i want to use that you use use that use that uh use the materialization you know you, you're going to want to push down your filters as far as down as possible on top of the scan right um then what, what the planner would do um, in the coordinator was that it would have to go and access um, the metadata and then figure out like, what are the data files I need to scan that's associated to um, um, you know, the partitions that, that I'm gonna access right, in the query. And so this thing would be all done in memory, right? And then once you've done that, then you need to, then we have the metadata to estimate the row counts, right? And then finally, when that's done, then we will send the data file paths over to the executor nodes, right, to start start doing the, the distributed scan, right? Um, and then within on the execution side, uh, we would have to go in and access the parquet row group headers and then do additional file pruning there, right? Because if you'll see, basically the non-partition field filters, you know, it had to be uh, basically pruned through the parquet row group headers, right? So, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple problems here. Right. Um, first is that, you know, in order to we, we use in order to avoid heap issues uh, during query planning, the coordinator, we had to limit um, the number of total files um, that, that we could scan after after pruning. And so there was a 300K limit there. Um, the other issue is, that, you know, there is no non partition field data file pruning. Right. That that was done in the executors. And so you had to go and look at all the parquet row group headers to do, to do that non-partition field uh, pruning. And then finally, um, the partition pruning was single threaded, right? It was, it was all happening in the coordinator. So how did this change? All right, so when we moved to iceberg tables, um, if you look at what planning does in the beginning, it's still the same. You gotta push down the filters, uh, you know, on top of the materialization scan, right? Um, then we have to access the partition stats, um, you know, to do the, you know, like, uh, you know, join, uh, join planning, join implementation. And so that, you know, I, I mentioned before, we had to grab the Avril stats off of, uh, you know, S3. There's a distributed cache for that. But then the next part is much simpler. So you basically end up sending the snapshot IDs of the iceberg tables that you want to scan, right? In this, in this case, the materialization table over to the execu executor nodes, right? And from there, then, then we do the usual steps, right? You access the manifest list, you do your partition pruning, you grab, you get your manifest files. From then you go, then you can distribute the work here, access multiple manifest files in parallel cross threads, right? And do additional partition and non-partition field pruning. Then you're down to the data files, right? That that can contain the data that that's possible for your for your query, and then. Um, then you do additional pruning at the parquet root group header level. You know, there could be like filters that can't be, uh, um, you know, that may have functions that you have to evaluate uh, against their, against the row group headers and that couldn't have been, that couldn't have been evaluated by uh, Iceberg. And so down, you're down to um, just the data that you want to scan, right? So, so what are the benefits here, right? So first of all, there's no planning limit on the max data files, right? Um, and what you see here is that we've now distributed uh, uh, the data file pruning, um, you know, on uh, on the second step here. 
And then finally, there's, there's just fewer uh, parquet root group headers that you need to access because you've done the, the, the non-partition non uh, field, field pruning uh, directly against the manifest files, right? But I'll just point out that in the end, it's really the same amount of data, data file scanning, but it was just you know, cheaper and less expensive to get there. All right, so let's talk a bit about um, kind of the, the benefits, right? The new features um, that Dremio Reflections achieved by moving over to um, Apache Iceberg as a materialization storage. Um, so like, you know, we're, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with hidden partitioning and partition transforms, right? I mean, the basic idea is that the user query doesn't need to worry about the partition pruning, right? So the user query comes in and says like C1 is equal to a particular day, uh, date and, and C1 is, um, you know, partition um, is rolled up uh, is rolled up to uh, the month level and partition there, right? You know, Iceberg will be able to convert this value into the partition value and then do the pruning, right? Likewise, if, um, you know, if you had a high cardinality column like user ID, right, and it was bucketed, right? Again, the user could filter on a specific user ID, um, um, but then, you know, Iceberg will figure out the partition uh, value for that and do the part uh, pruning there. And so, uh, before Iceberg, right, uh, you know, we'd only supported the identity transform, right? Um, whereas after Iceberg, then there's all these additional transformations like the bucket, truncate, date rollup, and identity as well, right? So what are, what are the benefits here, right? So first of all, you know, it basically allows you to align your materialization tables partition strategy uh, to match the query patterns, right? So again, you know, it, the goal here, right, is to maximize your data file pruning. Um, but other interesting benefit is that you can also align your partition strategy to how the source data changes, right? And 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 this is something that that allows us to basically support like scenarios where we want to do uh, handle updates and deletes in the source data and still be able to to incrementally re refresh uh, our materialization uh, storage tables. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in in in, in a you know in, a, in two slides down. All right. So the third agenda item item has to do with uh, uh, keeping reflections up to date. And the the way I like to think of like uh, you know managing um, the materializations and, and and keeping that data up to date is that you your your goal is really to minimize the compute and storage costs for doing this right. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, cost considerations here, right, to look at. So, I mean, probably the most important one is whether your 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 refresh of that materialization is it a full or incremental refresh, right? Because full obviously is going to be much more expensive to do, incremental is going to be much cheaper, but then only certain query patterns can support an incremental refresh, right? For example, like what are the join types in there? What aggregates do you have in there? Are they nested group buys? Um, those type of things will, will make incremental refreshes much harder to do. Um, the other thing to consider is, you know, how long does the refresh take? You know, what are the compute resources given, you know, your, your, your you know, whatever executor uh, hardware resources that you have, right? How many nodes, how many cores per node, how much parallelism will you have, you know, in the cluster, right? And those are all important considerations. Finally, how much, uh, well, how much storage is used for each materialization. So it's very common uh, when, when we're building materializations uh, for our users that you know, they have 100 gigabyte um, you know, reflections, right? And, and typically what happens is as you're building a reflection, you might have another one that's currently being used, that's being, you know, being used by the planner to plan queries, right? And so there's gonna be some time where you're gonna have maybe like double or triple sizes of these uh, materializations like, you know, on disk, right? So there's a storage cost associated to that. And then finally, you know, you spend all this time uh, building these reflections, right? You wanna make sure that they're actually, you know, being used by queries, right? Is the planner actually, you know, selecting these materializations and putting them in the query plan um, and, you know, and, and actually accelerating queries, right? Or on the flip side, is a planner like considering these, these materializations for usage, but then, um, they, you know, they, they end up being more costly to use. It's better to scan the base tables. And so, you know, building that materialization wasn't, wasn't worthwhile. 
so a lot of these, uh, you know, these cost considerations can can be seen uh, um, in the Dremio UI. So let me show, just give you a quick demo of how that looks. So, so this is the reflection that um, we we had just built a second ago, right? Um, and so here you see it, um, we have all these metrics and, and stats about, about this particular reflection. So for example, you can see the how this reflection was uh, updated, right? There's different refresh strategy, refresh policies. Um, uh, you can see the, uh, when was the last time you query the data from the table, right? So this tells you um, um, uh, the state, the, the data state. Uh, how many records are in the reflection? Well, you know, this was a small one, so. Um, the current footprint, total footprint. So these could be different if like, you know, the planner was still waiting to drain queries off of the previous materialization. So we had, hadn't had a time to, didn't have time to uh, expire the snapshots. Um, you know, how long did refresh take, whether refresh was, you know, full or incremental. Um, so in our case, uh, Dremio picks the best uh, refresh method based on, you know, analysis of the query tree. Um, then also, you know, each, uh, uh, you know, the goal of re reflections, you know, one of the what top goals really is, is to make sure your, your, your dashboard queries can, you know, return in sub-second, right? So that implicitly implies that, you know, there's going to, there could be staleness with the data, right? And so some, you know, what we'll do is we'll set an expiration time on the materializations and say, okay, you know, um, the, you know, there's a three hour expiration um, on the reflection. And so what that is saying to the end user is that like we guarantee that when you, you when you use this reflection that the data won't be your data won't be more older uh, than than three hours for example. Uh, and then here you can see our, our like just counts right of like how many times the planner had tried to to substitute a, a materialization into the plan versus when it actually successfully did it, which is the accelerated count. And then here we have uh, you know you can click into the job history. And then basically look at the plan that was actually used to materialize that reflection, right? And so if you look at the physical plan, this is stuff that you might be familiar with because here we're writing the, the iceberg manifest, um, you know, metadata, and then here's where we're doing the commit into the into the catalog um, you know, to update you know, the metadata, the uh, the root pointer. Okay, so let's talk a bit about um, this. Some of the new features that we got with uh, moving the iceberg, right? And 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 this has to do with like snapshot-based incremental refresh. I mean, this is one area where uh, we've done a lot of R and D on. Um, so the idea is that like if your uh, materialized view is based on uh, iceberg tables as the source, right? What you can do is analyze the source table snapshot history, right? Since the last refresh. And determine like how can you uh, what's the best way to update that materialization, right? And so uh, we have two different uh, uh, workflows that we go through, right? So um, for incremental, so if if we look at the snapshot history and see that only um, data was appended, right? Then uh, um, we can, we can we can do this quick workflow where we just go and update the the, the materialization, right? And and you know this, you know there's lo there's logic in here to like skip over compaction snapshots. You know if the SQL or schema has changed, and we may have to fall back to a full refresh. But this this mode can support um, um, joins. It can support uh, aggregates. Um, uh, now, uh, what about uh, updates and deletes? Right, that's always a very interesting scenario. Right, and so we also support uh, updates and deletes in the source tables using something called a partition based incremental refresh. Right, and the basic idea here is that if we can figure out if, if first of all, the assumption is that there is a partitioning between the source tables and the materialization, that they are partitioned in a compatible way, right? And the idea is that if we can figure out what partitions has changed inside the materialization, right, in terms of um, data data being updated or deleted, we can basically rebuild those partitions to to, to get the the source data changes into into the materialization, and and this can be done incrementally. And so the nice thing about this approach is that this supports unlimited inner joins, right? And 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 we can do this with like aggregates on top with group buys, um, you know. And and you know, there's there's a possibility to do this with the outer joins as well. 
Um, with this approach, you know, if there is a partition change, right? So if partition evolution ever occurred uh, in your source iceberg tables, and then then you'd have to fall back to a full refresh. All right. Uh, now, if you can't do an incremental refresh, then you have to do a full refresh, right? And obviously, that can that can be very expensive, right? And so, in general, you'd only want to trigger that when there's data changes. Um, and so, you know, we have different refresh policies to you know uh, um, to set to determine like when to do this refresh, right? So, like for example, if you're if you're ingesting like say streaming data. Then you might want to use an interval-based refresh policy that says like every hour or every 30 minutes, every 10 minutes, right? Um, if you're doing batch ETL, where you're like say loading um, data at night, and then you want to refresh your materializations so that they're available for dashboards in the morning, then you might have a schedule-based policy. Um, the ETL tools or whatever scripts can also manually trigger the refreshes using REST or SQL APIs, right? And then we're also developing something new, um, which is where you know, we'll detect the, the table changes, um, you know, only for iceberg. And if we see uh, that the snapshot history has changed between the last time we materialized and, and now, we can trigger the refresh uh, automatically. Um, now, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, optimizations also to skip refreshes, right? So, for example, if you're on a scheduled policy and, and we see that, like, okay, it's time, it's time to, to do a refresh, but really if there's no data changes, right? Then we should be able to skip this refresh. And, and so the way we can do that is because, you know, every time for each materialization, as I said before, we, we capture the, basically the query tree, right? So we know all the snapshot IDs. We have like, like a data set hash, right? <clears throat> Which we use to basically determine if, if any data has changed at all. Um, and finally, one advanced thing that I can point out is that, uh, uh, you know, reflections can can be built on other reflections. So, the, so like if if during a materialization job, the planner sees that, oh, I can accelerate this 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 materialization job with another materialization, right? Then, you know, when it comes to refreshing, it would be much better for the for for you know our reflection management to wait for that upstream uh, reflection to finish materializing first before going ahead and 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 and. Uh, refreshing the downstream so so that you basically avoid duplicate refreshes. All right. Um, now with incremental uh, reflect, uh, reflections, right? Um, uh, storage table maintenance is very important, right? So here here's just an example of here's just a screenshot of a UI where you know we're doing um, incremental refreshes, right? And then you can see that there's vacuum table um, jobs being run. When we know the planner is done with a, a you know historical snapshot uh, of a materialization, and so we basically expire those snapshots in this vacuum table job, and then uh, you know periodically um, you know we'll also have to optimize the tables, right? So so we don't have this small falls problem. So we basically compact data falls and, and and rewrite manifests here in the optimized table job. All right. So the last topic is the iceberg uh, materialized view specification. So this is a really interesting discussion that's happening in the community right now. Um, and, and really the general idea is that it's, it's the ability um, to share a view materialization between engines, right? So for example, like ha let's say Spark builds um, a materialization uh, on, on a view and then Dremio is able to access the view and say, hey, there's actually a materialization on that view. You know, should I use that? Um, um, uh, rewrite queries to use that materialization instead. So, you know, uh, there is definitely a lot of interoperability challenges uh, to make this happen, right? Um, and so one of the key um, uh, uh, assumptions is that, you know, the, the latest view that both Spark and Dremio can access because it's in a shared catalog contains both engine-specific SQL representations, right? Because, you know, Dremio can't parse Spark SQL, Spark can't parse Dremio SQL, but, and so you have to have both representations present in that latest view and, and hopefully they mean the same thing, right? So assuming, you know, you can get past that, right? Um, when it comes time for Dremio to use that Spark materialization, right? Dremio will have to validate, right? That that uh, materialization is actually still um, um, up to date. And, you know, different engines are gonna have different, you know, you know, requirements there, right? One engine might say, okay, well, I can't tolerate any staleness, right? Whereas in Dremio, we can tolerate some staleness, right? Because our goal is to 
be sure that SLAs on the dashboards are met, right? And so we might have like a three hour uh, staleness tolerance. And so we have to be able to access all this, uh, that basically the query tree or lineage that Spark has written and then validate that, okay, we're still within that three hour tolerance. Um, and then, you know, for, for Dremio specific, you know, there's gonna be, you know, as I said before, reflections are many to one with uh, um, uh, materialized views, right? So only a subset of Dremio's reflections, namely the ones that materialize all columns in a view can really be, you know, potentially shared with other engines. Um, and then, you know, another another minor, you know, detail is that right now Dremio is, is, is writing the storage table. Um, 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 it's in a different catalog than, say, the shared view. It's, it's, it's actually in an internal Nessie catalog. So we have to get that into the same catalog as the view so that we can start sharing them. Um, okay. I hit 30 minutes almost exactly. All right. So thank you, guys. Uh, let's open this up for questions. Cool. Thanks, Benny. Great talk. Uh, we have a couple questions, and we've got a couple folks uh, who would like to go live. But so I'll do the written questions first. So um, and I'll choose first names here. Um, so MD has asked: Are there plans to publish materialized view implementation back into Iceberg open source, or is that implementation custom for Dremio's engine? Two upvotes on that. So that was a popular one. Yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll mention that. The the iceberg spec is is just how to re how to represent the 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 materialized view inside, I mean the storage table and and like the lineage inside the table, right? But there's a lot of work that goes around reflection or materialized view management and materialized view matching, right? Like how do you how do you keep that stuff up to date and how do you um, match the queries <clears throat> into, I mean match the materialized views into the into the user queries, and that's that's definitely going to be very engine specific, right? But I also point out that you know Dremio also has an open is 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 also open source, right? So you can, you know, the, you can actually see a lot of uh, you have access to the source code of how um, you know parts of where we do reflection management and, and reflection matching. Okay, great. Uh, Jan and I'm guessing from the last name that it's Jan and not Jan um, is asking. Any plans to enhance uh, incrementally refresh materialized views to support? updates, sort of upserts, uh, incremental refresh based on update timestamp and replacing a row with corresponding ID instead of creating a duplicate row in the reflection? Uh, replacing a row. Yeah, like, I think it means like upserts, like kind of if a value changes in a row, instead of append doing, I don't know if it's a confusion about append only versus upserts for materialized views. Yeah, we had actually considered that approach of handling incremental um, uh, reflections by like adding data and then doing the math on top of it to see if we can like right. math work out, right? But we, we what we have found was that doing uh, uh, partition-based uh, refreshes, you know, handle much more, many more scenarios, right? And and I think that's also going to allow us to like get into more scenarios where we do like say, you know, left outer joins. Um, and potentially unions as well. Okay. Um, from Steen, um, are the incremental reflection maintenance operations, vacuum and optimize, available in the open source version? Uh, so reflection maintenance operations. I, I'm not sure I can answer that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, and then there then were available live. in the cloud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a couple live uh Folks, so I will. Um, oh, actually, before I do that, because John just uh, did a follow up. So uh, his example, and this was back to the incremental uh, sort of the update versus append. Uh, he says an example is a table that is updated in a database. This could this change should be merged into the reflection instead of appending a new row. I think that was your understanding of the question. Yeah, I mean, so so uh, assuming you can target that 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 data change into a specific partition, right? We would basically rebuild those, rebuild that that partition. So if you have line, if you have aligned your, your partitioning strategy close to how your data is changing, then then we basically, you know, you know, re, you know, re, rebuild that that one partition. So so delete those parquet files and add new ones in. Right? It's not like, uh, um, you know, there's uh, we have delete files, right? Right. Right. Exactly. 
Okay, I'm going to put a couple people on live just for some fun here. First, we have uh, Fang. So you'll go first, Fang. Um, I hit the blue arrow. And so Fang should appear. Is that what happens? Hello, Fang. Unless Fang is left. Well, if he doesn't... Okay, let me try Peter. Leon. Oh, here we go. Here's Peter. <laughs> Peter, can you hear us? Can you see us? Technology is fun. Sunspots, Aurora <laughs> Borealis. Yeah. <laughs> Peter? Hey, you Rick, uh, this is Peter. I, do, do, you mind, do you mind skipping over to the next audience? I'm sorry? Do you mind skipping over to the next question? Uh, uh, not at all. Do you want to stay on the screen or do you want me to turn you off? Uh, turn me off, please. <laughs> okay, all right. Very good. Uh, oh, let me figure out how to do that. Yeah, I think I can do that. Remove. There we go. Sorry about that, Peter. All right. Uh, Hamid is asking, uh, the data types review columns um, are derived, except, for example, is it decimal or big int? And then he has follow-up questions, same for R double, et cetera. Different engines have different rules for data type of views. This issue is often ignored and has to be dealt with if views are shared across engines. Uh, sorry, I, I don't quite understand that. Yeah, question. it wasn't really a question mark. I think it was. Um, I think it was part of it was a comment about types, about typing in views. Yeah. Um, but it seemed like there was a question about you know do you does it do things get forced like uh, you know coerced into particular yeah yeah. Uh, on Dremio's website, we do publish like uh, how uh, data types convert. Um, um, but yeah, that 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 is definitely a, a challenging issue because we have to convert between like uh, Apache iceberg types against Apo uh, you know arrow types, and then all, you know Calcite has this, has its own type system, and so there there is definitely like you know conversion that's going 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 back and forth. Right. All right, uh, folks, any other questions? I guess those are the questions. Oh, one more just came in. Brandon is asking, when reflections are on a schedule, um, from what time to what time are they actually set for? Uh, that uh, seems to be implying there's a start and an end time. Um, well, typically what happens is, is that if you, set a, if, you, if you set a schedule you know, to, to update, I say, 8 a.m. A, 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 like on all weekdays, right? Then when that time comes, then then we'll trigger the refresh of that reflection, right? But but if that reflection depends on other reflections, right? We we will we'll make sure to do that in the right order, right? So 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 there's no duplicate refreshes. Yeah, I don't know if he's asking about whether you will terminate running a reflection if it's exceeding a certain time band. Uh, I don't know. It, you know, oh. maybe 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 if there's a you're you're running them hourly or something, and one of them hangs or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's a retry policy associated to to building the reflections. So, um, you know, like if 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 you saturated your engine queues or you ran out of memory, direct memory, you know, when building the materialization or um, stuff like that happens, right? There there's there's a retry policy, um, so which is configurable. All right, great. Um, I think that's it for the questions, and we are almost out of time anyway. Um, everyone, there should be a poll showing up. The one, let's see if it's there, the uh, one question evaluation survey for this talk. So please uh, answer the question there. Simple uh, five point scale. Um, and um, the next talks will be starting in a couple minutes. And Benny, thank you very much for your talk. Yeah, much thank you, Rick. It. Thank you guys yeah. for uh, Take attending. Care,